uh, Oil Change International, and I am based in Kenya. So to get us started, I want to introduce my fellow uh, speakers and panelists. Uh, and to my far left, uh, we have Tasneem Esop from Khan International. Um, Tasneem is a South African based uh, and an expert on climate, energy, and poverty. Um, she's also the founding director of Energy Democracy Initiative in South Africa and currently serves as the, as the executive director of Khan International, um, which is made up of over 1,900 civil society organizations in 130 countries. Um, next is uh, Claire Fison from Climate um, Analytics. And Claire is the co-heads the climate policy, uh, and her work includes developing 1.5 degrees compatible pathways and benchmarks for the fossil fuel phase out and renewable scale up, and tracking climate action uh, and ambition. Um, and to my right, uh, I have Tom uh, Goldtooth, who is an indigenous uh, environmental network. Uh, an executive director of the Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, an IPO based in North America. Uh, from his strength uh, of community organizing and leadership, Tom has brought issues of environmental, economic, energy, and climate justice, and the rights of indigenous people to international levels. He's also a member and executive committee of the Global Fossil Fuel uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative and um, International Indigenous Forum of Climate Change. Uh, and then next we have Lorraine, who is a facilitator of the Don't Gas Africa campaign and also the co-facilitator of the Africa movement building space. And to my far right, um, to my far right, I have <laughs> Mato from Human Rights Watch, uh, who is a senior advisor of the uh, Environment and Human Rights Division. Um, and Human Rights Watch uh, is an international organization documenting human rights abuses around the world uh, and in the context of the climate crisis. Um, so to get us started, um, I will have um, Claire Fison do a presentation uh, for us, uh, which will be based uh, on what, uh, why we need to, why the fossil fuel phase out is necessary to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. Great, thank you very much. Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. So, yeah, Climate Analytics, for those who don't know, we're a science policy, an international science policy institute. Um, and I'll be talking through some outcomes and results from three reports that we've released recently uh, on yeah, what does the science tell us about uh, what a fossil fuel phase-out should look like to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So first of all, where are we heading in terms of fossil fuels? Well, our production gap report, which we worked on with a number of other uh, think tanks, SCI, IASD, um, and UNEP, uh, showed that when you add up all of the fossil fuel production plans that governments have put in place, you get to twice the amount of fossil fuels in 2030 that you would need to get on a 1.5 pathway, 110% too much. Um, and when you break that down by fossil fuel, uh, that's around 30% too much for oil, 80% too much for gas, and 460% too much for coal. So clearly those governments, many of whom have come up with net zero targets, have put forward 2030 targets um, under the Paris Agreement, they're not doing that. They're driving a freight train through the Paris Agreement temperature goal with these fossil fuel production plans. Um, as part of this work, we also looked at what is needed for 1.5, and you can see that in the dark blue curve on this graph. Um, and what you need is for coal to be very nearly completely phased out by 2040, and oil and gas together um, in 1.5 pathways are phased out, fall by at least three quarters by 2050. I say at least because 
many of these pathways, they rely on technologies such as carbon capture and storage to a certain degree. They also rely on some levels of carbon dioxide removal. So if you take into account the uncertainties and risks associated with those, you would need to phase out faster. Also, if you take into account climate uncertainties and, of course, the damaging effects of fossil fuels for health, then you would need to phase out faster. And I think you can very justifiably call for a, a, a complete phase out by mid-century based on what the science is telling us. So then taking a step back, um, another of our reports, the State of Climate Action, looked across the global economy. We looked at 42 indicators to track climate action and looked at whether we're on track for those. Um, and you can see in the grid here that only one of those 42 uh, is green, is on track, and that's um, the share of electric vehicles and passenger car sales. Um, all of the others are off track, showing that we have a lot of work to go, including, you'll see there, public financing for fossil fuels, which is going in completely the wrong direction. Focusing in on the power sector, so looking now at the demand side of fossil fuels, in that red box you can see what we need to do with coal and fossil gas in the power sector. We need to phase out coal by 2040, but actually get it to very low levels, 4% by 2030, and gas, we need to um, also get it to very low levels um, by uh, 2040. Um, and those phase-outs, we're not seeing them going anywhere near fast enough. So coal, we need to see a seven times acceleration, and gas, we need to see a more than 10 times acceleration. And what's, of course, worrying is that we see significant pipelines for both um, there are over 1,000 fossil gas plants in the pipeline at the moment, so clearly inconsistent with where we need to go. Um, so taking a step back, um, what does the science say are key milestones, 4.5 degrees, and how can this guide our work on fossil fuels? Well, I think we all hopefully know these, and we need to halve emissions this decade by 2030, and that means cutting fossil fuel use by 40% by 2030. Um, we need to reach net zero CO2 by 2050, and in the near term, to get on track for this, we need to peak our emissions before 2025 at the latest. That was one of the key findings of the IPCC in its latest reports. But emissions are still rising, so we clearly, we're not even heading in the right direction towards our targets. We talk about reductions by 2030, but emissions are still rising because fossil fuel use is still rising. And so we took a look at what, when do we think global greenhouse gas emissions actually could peak? Um, could we meet that IPCC milestone and keep 1.5 in reach? And what does that mean for fossil fuel use? Um, there are signs that a peak is coming that kind of can provide some optimism. So the IEA said earlier this year that it looks like fossil fuel demand could peak this decade based on um, current policies that governments have put in place. And as a result, we could see a, a peak in carbon dioxide um, for energy use uh, as soon as 2023, as soon as this year. That's just carbon dioxide, but still very promising. Um, analysis by Ember, a think tank, has shown that uh, the power sector could be uh, already a plateauing, could potentially peak this year, um, and already half of the world has, has passed a peak in power sector um, fossil fuel use. Uh, and, of course, really important for whether or not we peak globally very soon is, is what happens in China, being um, the, the biggest emitter globally. Um, and there has been recent analysis to show that China could um, far exceed its goal of, of peaking by 2030 and actually peak emissions as early as 2024. So we built on these um, signs. Uh, we looked at three different scenarios for what could happen in the future. So our baseline scenario, we took the IEA's estimates based on current policies for CO2 emissions, and then we, we looked at what would happen if non-CO2 emissions just follow their recent trends, so they continue to rise uh, gradually. Then in the turquoise, we have a low effort scenario. So what would happen if just on top of that, we made no regrets uh, measures in the non-CO2 emissions, so these really low cost options for mitigating non-CO2 emissions um, and implemented our agreements that are already there, for example, the Kigali Amendment on cutting HFCs. But then the interesting one is the continued acceleration scenario. And this, in this scenario, we think, well, the IEA has historically underestimated progress in renewables. What happens if we look at uh, the, the acceleration that we're currently seeing in key clean energy technologies, so in wind, solar PV, and electric vehicles, and if that acceleration continues, um, that's what we look at in our green scenario. And we also add in that the signatories to the Global Methane Pledge 
uh, meet their commitments there. And you can see in the figure these kind of S-curves of, of what could happen to solar and wind and EV sales if they continue to scale, as you would expect uh, technologies like these to scale up once economies of scale start to kick in. And what we see is that in that green continued acceleration scenario, emissions could actually peak this year. That would mean that next year they would already start declining, and there would be a 70% chance in that scenario of emissions falling from 2023 to 2024, um, even when you factor in interannual fluctuations in emissions. There was other scenarios, so if you look at the red, the baseline that was based on the IEA, um, it, it, it peaks... Um, you see a, a gradual peaking around the middle of the decade, but it's more of a plateau, which is not what we need to do. We need to, we need to peak and then rapidly decline. The low effort scenario gets a bit further, so it peaks in 2025. Um, but again, it doesn't have a very steep curve afterwards. Um, only the green scenario actually meets the IPCC's milestone of peaking before 2025. But what's, I think, really promising is that that is a scenario grounded in what's happening at the moment. Um, of course, it's not a given that this would um, be realized. You'd need governments to stop propping up the fossil fuel industry and to really push uh, forward on renewables and kind of cutting red tape and making it possible for this acceleration to continue, but still very promising. And the reason why this happens is because what we see when we look at the growth in wind and solar is that they're, going so, they're growing so fast that they could overtake growth in energy demand. And at that point, you start to push fossil fuels out of the system. So in this scenario, coal would peak this year in 2023, gas in 2024, and oil in 2025, and fossil fuels as a whole would actually peak this year as well. And what this shows is that if you factor in how clean energy technologies are growing, the economic case for these technologies, any fossil fuel production plans come with a really high risk of becoming stranded assets in the long term. Um, and here you can just see how, uh, what these different levers that we looked at uh, contribute to the reductions between uh, 2023 and 2024. So the really big one on the left-hand side, you can see that blue bar, the continued EV, wind and solar acceleration is making up most of the reductions that we'd need. Um, perhaps more interesting for this event, on the right-hand side, you can see that it's displaced coal, and you can see the breakdown by country there that is contributing the most to peaking, but also, importantly, gas. And, of course, the role of gas would become increasingly um, important as you go through the decade. This is just really looking at uh, 2023 to 2024. There are other factors that we didn't include in our analysis. We didn't look at energy efficiency just because of data issues there. It wasn't because we don't think that's important. Um, we also didn't look at heat pump growth. We didn't, we didn't look specifically at deforestation in our scenarios, although we did include an estimate in this graph here. These would all increase the chances of peaking and increase the rate of decline in emissions after peaking. Um, now, that peaking scenario that we looked at, it isn't a 1.5 compatible scenario. We didn't look at all of the mitigation options available to us. We know very clearly what those are from the IPCC's analysis and from the IEA. I've put them in the bullet points there. We've all heard a lot about tripling renewables. Actually, that means five-fold increases in wind and solar, doubling the rate of energy efficiency improvements, accelerating electrification, and slashing methane emissions. Um, and those are all really needed to half... Um, and greenhouse gas emissions this decade. But most critically, and I think this is actually not spoken about enough, you need fossil fuel production and use to fall by 40% this decade. That's 6% per year starting today. Um, yeah, if you don't do that, you don't get the emissions reductions um, that you need to happen. So I think, yeah, hopefully that's given you a bit of a whistle-stop tour through what the latest science tells us about um, phasing out fossil fuels. It's, it's very doable, it's very important, and there are these other technologies available to help us get there. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks, Claire, for that uh, presentation. Uh, clearly, uh, we need to uh, face out fossil fuels in a full, fast, and fair, and funded manner. Um, our next uh, um, keynote speaker is uh, Tasnim, uh, talking to us about the imperative of climate justice in fossil fuel face out. Thank you very much, and greetings to all of you. Firstly, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to do this 
Let's not call it a keynote speech. I'm always intimidated when I'm told I must make a keynote speech. But let's say we're going to have a conversation, uh, and I'll make a number of re uh, I'll make a number of reflections, and hopefully it encourages engagement. So thanks very much again for the invitation. Now it's really great that I follow the science presentation, and the conclusion is that this is immensely doable. We have all the means to implement this. And so the big question is, so why are we not? And I think this is where I would like to enter into the conversation, because while we understand what the science says, and there's been enough reports, including the IPCC science reports, the IEA reports, etc., that tell us what we need to do and tell us also how we can get there we're still going in the wrong direction. So why aren't we? Why are governments not taking us in the right direction? And this is where the conversation needs to focus on the politics of this. So phasing out fossil fuels is not only going to be about what is possible in terms of the analysis, but we fundamentally understand that moving towards a phase out of fossil fuels, achieving agreements that countries will phase out fossil fuels is deeply political, it is about power, and it's deeply about vested interests. So good that the, you know, it's possible, but if we're not going to engage in the politics of this issue, if we're not going to recognize the power that we're dealing with, and if we're not going to have political strategies that understand that, and therefore, you know, being able to shift the current dynamic, then we'll not achieve this. We'll carry on presenting science reports, and we'll carry on and trying to understand, but why are we not moving in the right direction? One of the key elements that I think you know, part of the unpacking of the political strategy that we have to center is the issue of justice. Now, this plays out in, at different levels. One, of course, in the phase out of fossil fuels, the unwillingness on the part of many countries to just phase out fossil fuels, especially in the global south, has to do with the perception and reality that, in fact, this is not going to be just. It's not going to be equitable. Why do they have that perception? The first key reason that they have that perception is the reality that, in terms of the historical responsibility of especially global North countries, they have to go first. They have to go fastest. And what we're witnessing today is, in fact, the opposite. And what we're witnessing today is, in fact, global North countries continuing with expansion. And global North countries going to developing countries and say, you need to phase out coal. You need to do this, and we'll create all these wonderful partnerships, most of it loans-based, but in any case, you need to phase out coal. That's it. And I can tell you, it's not just developing country governments that's concerned about it. It's developing country citizens that's cynical about it. So the double standard, or the perceived double standard, and the perceived hypocrisy is playing out in the political spaces, both at the levels of citizens and at the level of government decision making in many global South countries. We're going to witness that dynamic right here at COP28. And you've already seen it. You've seen already which countries are saying, you know, they're not going to phase out, or, you know, this is uh, not uh, feasible, etc. So let's watch that dynamic play out. So that's the first point. The, the, the reality that between countries, the, the concept of an injustice playing out is important to recognize and acknowledge and deal with. And so certainly one of the strategies that we would have to look at, and already 
you know, uh, many organizations are doing that is putting more pressure on the rich countries to take their responsibility and act first and fast and stop the expansion immediately. It's almost in that kind of time frame. The second issue that I, I want to address is, of course, the issue of the phase out in terms of the pace of the phase out. Some countries will need to go first, and I've mentioned that. There's clearly distinctions in terms of uh, historical responsibility, but also capacity and capability. And certainly in this uh, phasing out process and when we wanting to address the phase out, we need to recognize that as well. Otherwise, there will be a, just a blanket, no, we're not going to do that. So for example, you cannot ever imagine that a Congo is the same as a UAE and a UAE is the same as the US. There has to be an understanding based on analysis and there's work being done by civil society on extractives equity to be launched in fact here at this COP uh, that's looked into this. Who should go first? Who should actually, uh, you know, who has enough capacity that would not require the kind of international support and funding as you know, others might have. So the analysis has to be done, but there has to be a recognition that some will go faster, others are capable, and should, even if they're not historically responsible, could go faster than others. And, and certainly we have to recognize that differentiation, actually. More clearly differentiated than existing differentiation that just talks about global south and global north. The third element that we would have to look at is, and really has to underpin an approach to a phase out so that we can ensure justice is that these phase outs of fossil fuels would have to be done through just transitions. Again, in this COP, there's a, a, a big uh, negotiation around what a just transition work program could look like, but certainly just transition at multiple levels. At a global level, we would need to recognize and have a clear understanding about the very concept of just transition. The concept itself, uh, you know, is like SDGs used to be understood. Everybody understands sustainable development in very different ways. So to just transition. The emphasis here has to be on justice. Transitions are happening. It's not inevitable that it would be just. And so a very deliberative approach to ensuring when we phase out fossil fuels, when we phase in to a new energy system, that has to be just. So what constitutes justice then? So the very process itself of planning for these phase outs has to be inclusive. So process, procedural justice is important. Redistributive justice is important. Um, and so clearly for phasing out, there has to be a, a, a justice perspective that actually drives these transitions. And a lot of work is being done by that already. The labor movement leads uh, around that and certainly uh, wider uh, civil society and impacted communities, etc., are very involved. But there's another element to this. Many of these uh, initiatives, whether it's a just energy transition, partnerships, etc., are often very, well, northern driven, donor country driven. And what we miss and will probably then inevitably then not address justice is the fact it's not informed by domestic needs at all. These partnerships are not embedded in any country's development plan. It's imposed, there's some great signing of agreements, monies might or might not flow, it might or might not be additional, there's a lack of transparency, um, and it's not embedded in any domestic development plans. That's not going to ensure 
that in fact it will address the needs of countries and in the developing world, those needs are developmental. It's to address poverty. It's to address inequity. It's a, supposed to address unemployment, etc. Access to energy. But these big plans, these initiatives, don't address the fundamentals of developing countries and communities that have these needs. So that's another area that we would need to look at and be, again, very deliberative about it. Be critical about it as well. And finally, uh, well, not exactly finally. <laughs> one, point be one point before final. <laughs> one of the things that I'm uh, often uh, interested in is, you know, the way we uh, quote the science. We often say science says this and 1.5 this and emissions must be this. And, you know, we quote the science on emissions. But we very rarely quote the science, and especially in IPCC 6, about what the science says about equity, about justice, and the need to understand where we are at and where we want to go in the context of our colonial history. We don't mention this. We need to. Because the most important element of the politics of power, the politics of injustice, the politics of inequity, falls within that domain of our colonial legacies. And if we don't acknowledge that where we are today influences the capabilities and capacities, especially of global South countries, then again, we are not going to achieve what we want to in terms of really ambitious outcomes in a process like this, and of course beyond these processes, to get the phase out we want. We have to be cognizant of that legacy and how it plays out into our present and how it can play out into our future. Finally, and it really is finally, one of the other <laughs> things we have to talk about is we talk about phase out, but what do we want to phase into? And what would that look like? And will we commit the same mistakes when we transition to a new energy system that we've made while we've been dependent on fossil fuels? The same power dynamics the same injustices, uh, really deeply concerned about human rights and the protection of human rights. Will it be equitable? Will it be just, etc., etc.? So the conversation of phase out cannot be divorced from the conversation of phasing and the transition and where we want to be as a world. Because phasing out isn't a technical issue. As a world, what systems we are wanting to transition towards. And those systems have to be just. So I want to thank you very much. Um, I hope that I've uh, shared some thoughts that could provoke discussion. I really look forward to the engagement. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tisneem, for uh, that um, discussion and um, emphasizing the need for justice in terms of uh, a fossil fuel phase out and uh, who needs to move first. So um, now if we can get into the discussion, I want to start with you, Claire. Uh, what does, um, I mean, based from, you know, you have presented about the science um, and uh, Tasneem has also talked about like, you know, facing in. So what does a fast, fair, uh, full and funded um, face out of fossil fuels mean uh, to you? And uh, what does that mean for the energy package, uh, especially now that we are in COP? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm eager to hear from others on the panel um, about this because obviously I have just represented very quantitatively what, what a phase out looks like. Um, and I completely agree with you, Tasneem, on the need to, to really reflect on what that means um, in terms of how you implement it. And of course, uh, the transfer of finance to where, it, where countries really need it. The, at the moment, we're spending so much money currently on prop propping up the fossil fuel industry. We need to end 
um, fossil fuel subsidies and instead be tra really transferring that money into um, being able to move away from fossil fuels and into uh, a clean energy system is really important. I guess maybe just to very briefly reflect on what I think the energy package uh, um, needs to cover based on what I presented. Um, we've heard a lot about unabated phase-outs. I think what's really critical is that we focus on a full phase-out. That's not using technologies that are deeply uncertain, that are not applicable, for example, in the power sector. We know that carbon capture and storage is not a solution in the power sector. The, the pathways we've looked at don't rely on it at all because, or maybe 0.3%, because it's just not a good option. And it, of course, it doesn't deal with upstream emissions that urgently need to be reduced. So we need a, a, yeah, a full phase out without this reliance on um, uh, yeah, these technologies that, that are only going to work in very specific circumstances, like in, in some industry. Um, we need it to be fast. So yeah, as I said, I think the science justifies a phase out by mid-century, but that doesn't mean delaying action until mid-century. You need to start soon. You need this 40% reduction by 2030. But of course, developed countries need to move first there. And um, we see this in, the, in our power sector benchmarks. For example, coal needs to be phased out by 2030 in the developed world. Um, and around 10 years later in the developing world. So, um, yeah, we need, we need developed countries to take the lead and we need to make sure the finance is there to um, enable that. And, yeah, I think you, you want to really see these three things, the scaling up of renewables, the doubling of um, energy efficiency, and the really rapidly reducing fossil fuels this decade on the way to a phase-out for a, a complete package. Thanks, Claire. Um, so, in terms of speaking of uh, fairness, injustice, and human rights, uh, Macho, I want to ask you, um, what would you want to see um, for the fossil fuel phase out to be fair um, and funded? Can everyone hear me? Is it working? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, Tasneem covered a lot of ground, I think, on the fair aspect of the phase out. Um, maybe I would like to add a few more thoughts on why it's necessary, why a, a rights respecting phase out is necessary from a human rights perspective. So as Charity said before, Human Rights Watch is an international human rights organization documenting human rights abuses around the world. And in the context of the climate crisis, we're particularly focusing on human rights harms caused by fossil fuels. Uh, so this year, for instance, we've looked at a few places around the world um, to document these harms. One of these places, uh, is Uganda and Tanzania. So we've released two reports on the East African crude oil pipeline, ECOP, which you might have heard of, um, which has already devastated thousands of people's livelihoods, causing food insecurity and severe financial hardships. And of, on top of that, uh, activists have been systematically subject to arrests, threats, and harassment for raising concerns around the project's impacts to their lives, livelihoods, and its potential climate harms as well. We have also ongoing research in the United States documenting the human rights toll of uh, fossil fuel and petrochemical operations in Louisiana's Cancer Alley, a 135-kilometer stretch of uh, approximately 200 industrial plants where toxic pollutants have uh, resulted in one of the in some of the highest cancer risks in the United States. We have also investigated um, how dangerously high pollution levels here in the United Arab Emirates, linked to the country's vast fossil fuel production and use, um, are causing major health risks to the country's residents, particularly migrant workers. And we will be releasing a report on that this coming Monday. So these are only a few examples of some of the places that we've looked at. And we are speaking to frontline communities who are facing on a daily basis uh, harms linked to fossil fuels, whose health is at serious risk, and who have trouble accessing basic needs, um, and whose right to a healthy environment is being violated. More importantly, some of these fence line communities are also at risk because of the work that they do, because of their activism, and because they are calling for a, a fossil fuel phase out and a just transition. So as we are striving to achieve a fossil fuel phase out at COP28, we cannot stress enough how important these voices are in order to achieve ambitious climate action. 
people and communities who are the most affected by the climate crisis not only need to be heard, but they need to be at the heart of the climate negotiations and of climate policies. But having a country like the United Arab Emirates as a conference host places the pressing need for a phase out and the necessary respect for human rights at the heart of COP28's agenda because these issues are deeply interlinked. So respect for human rights should be a precondition and a requirement for, an, for ambitious climate action. But as you know, the United Arab Emirates is a deeply repressive government with a zero tolerance policy against, uh, towards sorry, dissent. So how do we achieve a fossil fuel phase out in a country that doesn't respect human rights and that is aggressively expanding its fossil fuel production uh, and, and, and its fossil fuel operations? So as Tasneem mentioned before, how do we get governments to take us towards the right direction? Well, I would like to add that all governments that are part of the UNFCCC process and who are here at COP28 have existing human rights obligations and they need to protect and fulfill the rights of communities currently being impacted by fossil fuel use. And this particular point was raised two days ago by six United Nations special rapporteurs in a statement warning about the immense magnitude of the negative impacts, uh, human rights impacts of fossil fuels. To quote them, states must place human rights at the heart of all climate action. This is an obligation for states, not an option. So what we need for governments today is to show up for fence line communities and commit to a fast and rights respecting phase out of all fossil fuels. The examples that I've given today are not mere statistics. Um, they illustrate the human rights toll of fossil fuels on people and entire communities who are facing unprecedented risks and threats to their lives, livelihoods, and well-being because of the continued um, expansion of fossil fuels. So this needs to end now because fo phasing out fossil fuels, sorry, is uh, a human rights imperative. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, Tasneem, I want to get uh, back to you, uh, especially because, um, you know, the fossil fuel industry uh, has perfected the art of deflecting, denying, and delaying, especially in terms of the fossil fuel phase out. So with regards to funding, uh, what do you think, uh, you know, the energy package will look like uh, or should look like um, at the end of this COP? Yeah, the fossil fuel industry has to be held accountable and pay up as part of their responsibility, actually. So when we're talking about the package, uh, CAN International has come up with a three-part package. One, it is calling for a just and equitable phase-out of all fossil fuels. It is the phase in of renewables, and we talk about a 1.5 terawatt target. And finally, and importantly, is the finance, the provision of finance. And again, this is linked to the justice and equity element. We cannot expect countries to phase, developing countries, many of them, to phase out and phase in and deliver certain targets in the phase in without financial support. And so it has to be a three-part package. Any one of them without the other will not be a success in our view. And part of mobilizing the finances, because of course we hearing governments, especially rich nations tell us there's no funding. We don't have finance. So firstly, rich nations can find the funding. They found the funding for wars for subsidies, for all the perverse things in this world. And secondly, the fossil fuel industry has to pay up for sure. They've made windfall profits. It's immoral. It's actually quite atrocious. And they should be paying up. And so part of mobilizing the funding has to include taxing not only windfall profits, but consistently taxing the fossil fuel industry and hold them uh, accountable through uh, 
reparations, basically, uh, as well. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Tisney. Um Lorraine, I, I want to uh, get to you because, uh, you know, there is a scramble for Africa in terms of gas and uh, now more recently in terms of the carbon markets. So what are the obstacles uh, towards us achieving a full, fast and um, fair face out of fossil fuels? Okay. Thank you very much, Charity. So I really want to first articulate on you know, the context in Africa that there seems to be a, a dilemma of, inconsi of inconsistency amongst African leaders, amongst our politicians and bureaucrats on what a just transition really constitutes. We've heard since last year uh, during COP27 when our own African leaders were trying to push for gas as a transition fuel and demanding that Africa has to develop uh, because of gas. But we all know that this has come from the energy crisis and it is mal-aligned support from European governments, from European companies who are seeking to export and extract gas from Africa. So it's not to remedy the energy poverty in Africa, it's not to uh, make sure that the, the nearly one billion people in Africa that lack access to clean energy have access. It is extractive, it is maintaining a colonial and apartheid system whereby African people poor communities are marginalized from, from, from the energy system. So I'll give an example again of how our African leaders have been compromised by the purported power and the weight of, of, of the oil and gas lobby. For example, in South Africa, the energy minister was backing the controversial oil and gas exploration in the Indian Ocean by Shell Corporation. Yet South Africa just signed the Just Energy uh, Transition Partnership, right? And we are assuming that it is to move away from fossil fuels, and yet we're still seeing African countries going back to fossil fuels, and it defeats the whole point of transitioning away from fossil fuels. Again, if you look at Senegal, which was selected to be a beneficiary of the Just Energy Transition Partnership, we're still seeing Senegal seeking for support from Germany to extract gas in Africa. And already we have seen thousands of fisher folk in the Senegal, uh, in the Sendri community, being excluded and taken away uh, from their fishing activities because total, because Shell has to extract gas in the ocean, right? So these are the main examples that we are seeing in Africa of the confusion that is happening. So just to be clear, gas is not a trans uh, transition fuel for Africa, but it is a dangerous fossil fuel that will increase future emissions for Africa. Initially, Africa only had four countries that had been uh, extracting gas before the energy crisis. And now, we've got more than nine countries that are actively extracting gas. These are nine in addition to the four. So, which is making Africa another hub of extraction, similar to what we see during colonial times when Africa was seen as a zone of extraction of cheap commodities, by the way, for the benefit of Europe. So again, another issue that I would want to speak on is how we need to push and address the, 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 the financial system. Um, so far, Africa has only been receiving 3% of the global finance around renewable energy and 2% when it comes to climate finance. So this is very little compared to what is needed by Africa. And so we are calling for a shift um, around the global policy around finance and investment. We are also calling for the Africa Development Bank to move away from funding of fossil fuels. We're calling on the World Bank to move away from funding of fossil fuels and rather invest that uh, uh, money to renewable energy. And again, we are calling for a stop, an immediate stop to malaligned support by Europe, by companies in Europe. This includes companies from Italy, such as ENI, including corporations such as Total, including corporations such as, such as BP and Shell, who are pushing us to, to accept and to put shove down our throat fossil fuel projects. If you look at what is happening in Mozambique, without conscience, uh, when the Palma bombing happened, we saw fossil corporations, instead of protecting community, we saw the government sending 800 soldiers to protect uh, uh, gas uh, infrastructure instead of protecting women and children that had been affected by that bombing. So this is what happens when we allow the fossil fuel energy system as it is to perpetuate. 
And as African people, we are demanding a just transition away from fossil fuels. And when we talk about a transition, it is a revamp of the entire system. We need to ensure that uh, energy systems are compatible with our food systems, our water systems, our livelihoods. We need to ensure that energy is seen as a right, not a commodity that can be used by corporations to profit off of uh, the energy that is meant for the people. We also need affordable financing for Africa so that poorer nations are able to transition. And of course, that should be coming from, from, from fossil corporations who have uh, grabbed the, the, the atmospheric space and polluted it and, result, and of course the global warming. That is where the money should be coming from. We are not shy to say that uh, we are demanding from them or from rich nations. We are not begging. It is a right because they are the ones that committed uh, uh, the, 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 the pollution. And we're also demanding for respect of planetary boundaries. We need uh, energy systems that are compatible with nature, that are compatible with our oceans, that are compatible with our mountains, our soil, and the atmosphere in general. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lorraine. I like your point about uh, we are not begging. It's uh, it's a right. Um, so, Tom, I wanted to ask you, uh, in terms of like everything that has been discuss discussed, uh, what is then stopping us from achieving a full, fast, and fair and funded uh, fossil fuel phase out? Good, good question. Uh, I've been coming to these uh, conferences of the parties since 1998. Uh, at that time, I was uh, delegated by not only uh, tribal governments, uh, but by our traditional people, spiritual people, and the grassroots. We are a grassroots network, the Indigenous Environmental Network. So it's been frustrating, definitely. We've used terminology like corporate takeover, yeah, and all that. Uh, but, you know, we're still holding the line, especially around uh, conveying the importance of the voice of the people of the land, the first peoples in many of the regions and nation states that have indigenous peoples. So uh, a lot of my response reflects years of consultation and ceremony with indigenous peoples in the Pacific, in, uh, in the Amazon, tropical forests, in the North Arctic. So, you know, I've used that quote, systemic change, because we know that right now, uh, you know, all the mitigation in the, in the UNFCCC and the implementation and the operatization of uh, everything coming out of the Paris Agreement are tailored to fit the economies and resources of the wealthy nations. We know that. So the question is, how do we make achievement? How do we have a, a just transition away from a fossil fuel economy? That's the heart of one of the heart of, of, of an issue right now. And how do we confront capitalism, disaster capitalism, these different mechanisms that actually provide nothing but greenwash, you know, to uh, to the polluters to be able to have uh, mechanisms that are, are, uh, have no real methods of being accountable, uh, reporting and monitoring that can be manipulated. But it's also a question of asking what is, what is climate finance? Those of you who have worked on that area, you may have seen our report that we made Last year, COP27 is on our web page that addresses the inequities uh, uh, of climate finance and funding. Uh, you know, it, it comes from a system that preys upon our communities. It takes money from the polluters. So the, the contradiction is that the polluters are investing to a system that we're trying to, to, to mitigate. So there's no additional agreement on what uh, definition of climate finance is. Uh, 
And that's something that we really have to address. We don't talk about that. The governors don't talk about he, that in the hallways of, uh, of uh, the COP. But also, it's hard not to mention real quick, you know, coming from the belly of the beast of the United States, the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act that, that is now law that funnels billions of dollars uh, to climate fault solutions like carbon capture and storage, uh, hydrogen, um, biomass, biogas, critical minerals, carbon markets, conservation forests, biodiversity, soil offsets, and it continues, nuclear energy, fault solutions. We are in the front lines, indigenous people. It's a life and death issue. It's a rights-based issue. But we have debates right in the hallways where there are governments that don't want to include language around human rights and the collective rights of indigenous peoples. We're not fighting for our individual rights. We had to fight already 20 years in Geneva to just have S on peoples, to have the collective rights and inher inherent rights to speak and have a voice. So yes, those are challenges that we have when we talk about a fair, just transition. What does that really mean when we look at a lot of the, the laws, and we have to call them colonial laws, how do we uh, decolonize the system as people from throughout the world, humanity, take responsibility and address these issues and infrastructures that allow the continuation like on geoengineering, techno fixes, and carbon trading regimes that allow the polluters, was said already, allows them to greenwash, not to take responsibility. These dirty energy practices falsely say they're going carbon neutral. Come on, that's a lie. It's a lie, and like everyone's accepting it. And net zero, what does net zero mean? So those are things that we need to address in order to have a fair transition. Uh, there's a lot of unscientific assumptions when you really look at it. And people do use Western forms of science. But even some of the scientists are saying, this is the best solution we got. There are some scientists that do question it. More reports that these, uh, fault solutions are, are not adding up. One thing, they do not cut admissions at source. They do not cut admissions at source. So let's start saying that. Um, so we're looking at systemic change. We're looking at uh, ways that we can also change a colonial legal framework that privatizes life itself. You know, I just came from a rights of nature session in, uh, hosted by the government of Ecuador. They have a pavilion, and uh, Ecuador initiated national legislation, law on rights of nature. Is it perfect? No, I cannot say it's perfect. But they've made a step to challenge the system, uh, and, uh, and, and that's why we do need to have uh, civil society. We need to have the grassroots. We need to have the indigenous peoples. Uh, and we do have an outside, uh, inside strategy. Uh, it's not uh, surprising to me that we have these two cops in countries to where there's the, there's the prevention of a voice of civil society outside. It's been very effective in the years that we have put literature out in our, in, on these issues of trying to uh, wake up humanity to fight for a fair uh, and just transition away from uh, a, a system that is at war with Mother Nature, nature a violence against Mother Nature. And that's the core of what I just talked about on another session. Why is it that we have corporations and world banks and investors investing in a system that wants to kill Mother Nature, a, a, a object, objectification of the female created principles of Mother Nature in the same way it's a system that objectifies our woman.
It's the same thing. How do we change that system? So that's the core. The last thing I just wanted to, 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 to mention is that we're part of the Banking on Claim, Climate Chaos report that comes out every, every year. But right now, our last report, the world's 60 big, biggest banks poured over $5.5 trillion over seven years into fossil fuel industry, driving, of course, climate chaos and causing deadly local community impacts. This is since 2015 at the Paris Agreement. So fossil fuel is expanding. Yes, they are going to burn up uh, the oil uh, until it's exhausted, you know. So how do we organize strategically around that without feeling this disempoweredness? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, clearly, we need uh, um, systemic change, and uh, uh, we need to stop the greenwashing, the dangerous distractions, and all the other fancy terms that the uh, fossil fuel industry is uh, coming up with. Um, so now I want to take it to open the floor for uh, anyone uh, with questions. Uh, for any panelists, feel free to uh, ask. Uh, ask questions, um, and maybe you can introduce yourself and say who you're directing your question to. So, yeah, the floor is open. Hello, I'm Alistair Thompson from Scoop Media. Um, I'd like to ask what potentially the panelists could perhaps ask, answer the question, what could be changed in the COP process to better address some of these issues in terms of the procedures? I mean, it seems as though we've been talking about this for 30 years and not made any progress. What's wrong with COP? Why isn't it fixing this? Um, who would you want to answer a question? Lorraine? Uh, so I've got one simple contribution. First of all, we need to get polluters out of COP and they need to stop funding COP. We've seen it from last year. So we've seen from last year when the COP last year was fully funded by Coca Cola, fully funded by Fossil Fuel Corporation. This is a climate space where we're supposed to be looking for solutions. People affected need to be at the forefront and to be supported, to be engaged in the negotiations. And we need to make sure that fossil corporations, governments that benefit from the fossil economy are not really part of uh, the negotiations, but step aside while we tell them what we need for a transition away from fossils. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Lorraine. Um, any more questions? Yes. Can I, can I, sorry, can I oh, yes, Mato, maybe you cannot. Um, and on the process, can you hear me? Yes. Um, on the process, I think my mic is not working. I will scream. <laughs> thank you. Um, oh, thank you for your question. I think there's also something to add about where these conferences take place. So as I mentioned before, we're in the UAE today. Who knows where COP is going to take place tomorrow? <coughs> I think the UNFCCC has also an important role to play to make sure that these spaces remain transparent, remain open to meaningful participation, specifically by those who are mostly impacted by the climate crisis and by civil society. So yes, it would be good for the UNFCCC to think about developing a set of criteria in the future to make sure that this can be achieved. Yeah, yeah I'd also like to add, so I, I do want to say that we have to do all of those things, the processes, the criteria, etc. But you can't win things at this COP if you didn't win it back home. And so the fights need to happen back home. We have to use our power at national levels, 
and then collectively at global levels to fight the fossil fuel industry. So in addition to changing some of the problems in the process itself, governments come here with positions. This process is government driven, party led. We need to fight the battles back home and get our governments to take the right positions. We've heard what Lorraine says. In Africa, we have all these challenges, yet our African leaders are basically selling out the people. Same goes for most governments. So certainly, I think we need to recognize that our power, our power is going to change things. That has to happen at home and then collectively at the global level as well. Everything doesn't happen in a COP. The world's not going to change in a COP, and we shouldn't expect that the COP is actually going to, uh, you know, bring about system change. The battles need to happen at home, and then again, all of us collectively fight at global levels. Thank you, Tesnu. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I want to respond to that because that has uh, that resonates with the work that we've been doing not just as indigenous peoples. In the United States and Canada, we saw that the system wants to keep us divided. So we saw back in the, the Battle of Seattle, the WTO ministerial meeting in the night, late 90s, when we organized as American Indian and Alaska Natives with black folks, with Latinos, with Asian, under the environmental racism, confronting that as a core and how do we organize and come together as people of color and indigenous peoples. The corporations were threatened. The government was threatened. So there was an initial, there was been years of attack. So as we use that strategy around climate and forming alliances and coalitions to break that divide and organize, and organize with our brothers and sisters from developing countries from the global south. That is again threatening. So organizing, organizing, organizing community because my experience, the community are not informed. They're told lies that, you know, they believe, you know, these mitigation plans. Uh, they're given money, small farmers, uh, La Via Capucina, small farmers and peasants are told they, that they can earn money. They can earn money uh, by not turning the soil or taking climate friendly seeds. But that money comes from the polluters to, to say they're going carbon neutral. Our, our people dependent, uh, forest dependent communities and indigenous people in the Amazon said, we'll pay you for your traditional knowledge because you've been protecting the forest all these, since time beginning, we're gonna pay you for that, but help us to mark all the trees for carbon inventory to fit another issue of offsets. So these are things how we have to organize. We organize and put on workshops in the grassroots, in the Amazon, in the language, and they say we did not know about this. We were told lies, even by our indigenous intermediaries that were bought off by a $4 million World Bank grant. That's our stories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, I think I saw another question there. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Babawali Obayanju. I'm from Friends of the Earth Nigeria and Friends of the Earth Africa. I want to ask or bring up a point that Tess raised before she rounded up her speech. Um, it's on the quest for this transition we are talking about. I'll give you a story from Nigeria. When we, the CSOs, I was quite young at that time, we're clamoring that the military leave power and transit to democracy. The shout went on, the fight went on, and at last, civil society won that fight, and the military left. But then it was left for the people now who will become the leaders. No civil society person was ready. And what did the military do? 
they took off their military uniforms and wore civilian clothes and became our leaders. So it's high time for us, while we are clamoring for a just transition, to actually look at the system that this transition is going to follow through. Another story from, the, from Nigeria. The core community where Friday's there, Benue, where some women walked tirelessly and stopped the mine from being functional. They were promised that after the mine leaves, with the holes they dug in the communities, many like 10 story buildings deep, that they were going to fill it back with sand after they, they finished the exploration. How possible is that? So the minerals that we need for this transition will take such forms. Communities are going to go. Towns are going to go. Even some, half of some countries are going to go. So the more we start making noise about this transition and how it should go, the better for us. So it's time for every one of us in this room, while we are shouting for the transition to happen, think about the process. Mining is more dangerous and deadly than extraction from oil. Both are not good. So we need to sit down collectively and look at it together. How do we make this transition just? How do we make it people-centered? How do we make it that it's meeting the needs of the country? Like Lauren said, not for meeting needs outside of the continent, but how would the energy poverty in our different regions be take, um, catered for and answered? I think this is a pose for all of us to think about. How would this transition happen? How do we want it to be? And let's start defining it now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Baba Wale. Um, I think um, there was another question on the floor on this side. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for all your statements. Um, I had a quick question. Um, given that you had said that um, you would like to see the complete um, um, divest from like fossil fuels. How do you feel about um, how the president of COP28 emphasized how um, in the future he would rather have like fossil fuel agencies more in the discussions versus um, having ha versus leave leaving them out of it? Um, I can rephrase it. That's a, I can rephrase it as well. Okay. I was just like, how do you feel about just like the cop, the cop president wanting to um, move, wanting to include fossil fuel agencies more in, in the discussions when um, you have said that um, you'd rather like have them out of like cop, which makes sense. Um, so I want to talk about the fossil the four solutions and the dangerous distractions that we've been witnessing as a result of including fossil fuels. So I think it is very short-sighted uh, for, for the presidency. Of course, he's lobbying for his own, given his position within the fossil industry. That's why it, is not, it was not a good decision anyway to install him as president, given his position. So the dangerous distractions that we've been seeing, such as carbon markets, um, we have been told, I'll give an example of the Red Plus project that, you know, a long time ago, I've talked about it earlier on, that in Africa, there was a Red Plus project that was introduced I think I was still in university or just finishing university and we were told to keep our forests to avoid a climate crisis. And now, years after I've left university, the crisis has even intensified. So this is what happens when we see fossil corporations taking center stage. They push for four solutions. Now we're seeing carbon markets again. It's another imitation of the Red Plus project that failed. We are now being told again to keep our forests in Africa to pave way for... for, for I don't know, for polluters to continue to pollute. So they are only there to push for false solutions. We need to ensure that corporations, fossil corporations, particularly historical ones that have been polluting and continue to do so and continue to scheme and find ways around, uh, you know, maintaining their profits. We need to ensure that they are held accountable. So that is the only space that they need to be given. Like that where we are telling them, you know, uh, where we are holding them accountable and where they are paying for, for, for loss and damage, where they are paying reparations so that they don't continue to profit off of the lives of people that are dying as a result of climate disasters. So it is very short-sighted and it is expected, of course, given that, uh, you know, the presidency is aligned to the fossil um, industry. Thank you so much. Um, 
So I'll allow only two questions, so here and there. Okay, thank you very much. So I wanted to know, what's the plan for those working with the polluters companies in this transition? What's the plan for the workers in the polluter companies? So the, the essence of a just transition is about ensuring that workers are protected. So workers in those companies have to be included in the process of planning the phase out, the phase in, included in overall just transition processes. Impacted communities, workers who are also impacted by in these industries will have to be at the table to ensure justice for those workers as well. Our enemy here is not the workers. And of course they will feel, rightly so as workers, that their futures are under threat. But if they're part of the just transition process, that they co-determine where we will go to, that they co-determine what kind of social protection measures there are for workers, that their rights are also secured. I think that is also going to be a very important driver for change as well. Labor, communities, indigenous peoples have to be united and work together for the just transition. So yeah, I, I want to be very clear that our, you know, our brothers and sisters in these industries, the workers and the working class, they're allies and we must work with them. There's going to be resistance, it's natural, but they are allies. The owners of these companies are not. Thanks so much, Tisney. Okay. Yeah, just maybe to add very quickly to that, I fully agree. I think the, what a big risk for those workers is if these companies don't plan for the future and find themselves suddenly in having to make very, very rapid changes to their industry because, of course, their industry does not have a future. And so really what you need these energy companies, these fossil fuel companies to be doing is planning what does their business look like out to the future and what does that then look like for these workers because if they, they don't do that, it's, it's deeply irresponsible for, for their futures as well. Um, awesome. Thank you, uh, Claire. So just one last question. Hi. Thanks for the chance to ask a question. Thank you to all the panellists for your really inspiring remarks. My name is Mike Davis and I work for Global Witness. We're an NGO that investigates and campaigns to reduce the power of fossil fuel companies. And my question's for Lorraine. Um, Lorraine, you talked about the impact particularly of companies like Shell, Total, Eni. Uh, these are all firms that we've investigated and exposed for corruption and conflict financing in the past. But um, it'd be really helpful to hear your thoughts on how um, Northern organizations like ours can best support the sort of struggles which you're describing amidst the, the new push to extract more gas and, and more oil from sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, thank you for your question. So um, when corporations come into Africa, their headquarters are not in Africa. Their offices are difficult to access. So sometimes we need access to those spaces and to those offices so that even the end consumers of their projects know the impacts that are happening in Africa. More often, even the few times I've traveled, I've seen uh, total energies, like their advertisements, they're advertising this very, you know, whimsical picture of, you know, their contributions, and yet they've got very um, dangerous distractions and uh, negative impacts that they've had on African communities. So we need to be showing the other side of, of, of uh, how fossil corporations have been behaving in Africa so that we expose them even taking them to courts, even challenging them and carrying out actions in your locations. Because I believe that if consumers are aware of the impacts, it will then allow greater accountability of the corporations. Thank you so much, Lorraine, and thanks for engaging with the conversation. And so um, as we are wrapping up, uh, I just want to ask my panelists to share uh, some closing remarks. And maybe we can start with you, Mato. Wow, I think everything was said, um, but I think, um, as Tasneem said, you know, this is not the only space where um, climate action and climate policies take place, but let's see what the next couple of weeks can give and what we can achieve 
My last message, if this is going to get out, I would want to appeal to our African leaders not to uh, sign on to gas deals during COP28. That happened last year. It should not happen this year. Our African leaders should be talking about a total phase out, not phase down, but out of fossil fuels. And we do not want any new fossil fuel investments in Africa, including coal, oil, and gas. Thank you. That is powerful, Lorraine. Um, yeah, I, no, I think this has been a really interesting uh, panel discussion. I don't have much to add. Maybe just um, to reflect on that we've shown that the uh, we've talked a lot about fossil fuel phase out and the need to know where we're actually going. And I think there are a lot of hopeful developments happening, um, in particular with um, renewables. And I just wanted to emphasize our message that it is still possible to peak emissions very, very soon and get on a track to 1.5 degrees. And I think we mustn't lose that hope that this process can still deliver on that. But of course, we need to ask governments um, to come forward with a very clear strategy for a fossil fuel phase out. Yeah, I think we we together for two weeks in this space. Let's use this space and push as hard as we can to get an ambitious outcome, and that is about also waging resistance in the blue zone. We might not be able to wage it outside of the space, but certainly let's wage resistance inside the blue zone. And there are lots of actions taking place. Join the actions, be part of it. Pressure your governments. Call out the uh, fossil fuel industry. They hear in numbers. Do the stuff that people like us do and do it effectively. But then leave here and go back home and do what Tom Goldtooth encouraged us to do. Organize, organize, organize. I'll add mobilize, mobilize, mobilize. Resist, resist, resist. Thanks so much, uh, everyone. Uh, I think um, what this side event has concluded is that uh, we do have the power. And uh, while we are at this COP, let's make uh, the match out of it to ensure that uh, we can achieve a fast, fair, and full and funded uh, face out of fossil fuels, that it is possible that we need to push um, our leaders for us to get there. So thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>